Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. We've got a great Google Talk coming up, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Patty Hirsch. Uh, Patty is a senior producer at the American Public Media's business radio program, Marketplace, and is also the creator of the acclaimed Marketplace Whiteboard. His recently published book, Man vs. Markets, Economics Explained Plain and Simple, focuses on demystifying markets and using stories to explain economic terms and principles. Uh, he then relates these stories back to real-life examples, such as the mortgage crisis of several years back. But I'll let Patty explain more. Um, please join me in giving a warm and googly welcome to Patty Hirsch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for feeding me. You know, I've been up here before a couple of times, and I always forget how good the food is. So it's a real treat today. Thanks for that. Um, so usually when people ask me to, to speak, they're usually very, very specific about what they want. I mean, it's usually things like, can you explain monetary policy and inflation? Can you talk to me about the Volcker rule, whatever it is? So whenever I'm, I, I asked, you know, what, would it, what, was, what is it you'd like me to speak about today? And the answer that came through, back through the, my, my publicist was just something about technology. So I thought, OK, well, those of you who have read the book will know that I actually talk a little bit about high frequency trading uh, in, in man versus markets. And so I thought, well, I could, I could talk about high frequency trading. And then I thought a little bit about that. And I thought, hang on a second. I thought about algorithms. And uh, you know, you guys are kind of the kings and queens of algorithms. So there's something of a risk coming here and talking to you about algorithms, right? It's kind of like me going to St. Peter and talking to him about gate security. Uh, so Peter, I think you need a few dogs over here. You know, maybe you need one of those you know, fingerprint readers. Get out of here. So I won't talk about that. Well, I might talk about that a little later if you'd like me to. But um, let's talk about something else that you know, Google really um, does specialize in, which is in identifying and meeting a need, which is something that, uh, which is really what the man versus markets was born from. Um, could I see a show of hands? How many people actually know Marketplace, the video show? OK, that's great. Does anybody, is, do, do people know the whiteboards, the, uh, the video products that we put out on, on the web? Any takers there? OK, we kind of need some more outreach there. Um, so. What happened was, you know, Marketplace has been in existence for quite a long time now, and we've been doing a great job, I think, over the last, you know, 15, 20 years of actually taking business news and breaking it down into, in, in, and, and delivering it in a way that most people can understand, like regular people can understand, rather than people on Wall Street. And that's really the, the, the battle is to, we, we saw a need back then. We saw, you know, people were reading the business pages that came out of the Wall Street Journal or the back page of the New York Times or listening to, uh, to business commercial radio and saying, you know, we, we don't understand what you guys are talking about. We don't understand this language. So Marketplace was really invented to, to meet that need, to meet the need of regular people to understand what was going on on Wall Street, what was going on in business, so that they could relate that to their own lives. So we then said, um, well, you know, how can, we, how can we improve on that? And really, we, we couldn't really see that many ways of doing it. We were really the only people in, on a landscape of really radio and television in general that were doing it. We had the niche programs like CNBC, which is really delivering to a certain audience. And it was us, which was delivering to, to, to people like you and I. Come the financial crisis, we realized that there was a gap. So the financial crisis hit, or even before the financial crisis, whenever Bear Stearns started to collapse, and we had this terrible credit crunch that was really gripping the economy really badly. And we realized that even though we were breaking terms down or breaking the language of Wall Street down to a certain extent, we weren't breaking it down all the way. Because suddenly, terms would just sort of pop out of the back end of Wall Street, like CDOs credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations, securitization. And we started to realize that we were using that language in our, in, in our own programming. Because it was really, really hard to find a way to, to break down those concepts. They were so dense and so complicated. We couldn't find a way to break it down. So when I happened to come from Wall Street. I used to work at a, an organization called um, Standard & Poor's. I used to work uh, for a division of them that was uh, that, like that little news division that they had reporting on corporate finance. And I'd happened to work in securitization. I'd covered that for many years. So somebody asked, you know, Patty, can you explain how this stuff works? So I used an analogy that I used when I was training people for Standard & Poor's, which was to talk about a, a cascade of, 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 um, of, of, of glasses at a wedding. Even if you haven't been to a wedding where they have those, the glasses all stacked up on, each, on, on, on themselves where you can pour champagne on the top, you've probably seen it in mafia movies. You know, they have it there. They're pouring the champagne on the top, and it all cascades through. So I use this as a way to explain how a securitization instrument worked, how one of these CDOs work. Somebody took a, a photograph or took a video on, a, on a, one of the really basic camera phones that they had then, 
and we slung it up onto the web, and we had just you know hundreds of thousands of hits almost instantaneously. It was amazing. So clearly, we saw there was a real there was a real thirst for knowing what these very exotic instruments were, and we thought this is really strange because who really wants to know what a CDO is? Really, nobody needs nobody wants to know that until it's crashing your economy, in which case everybody wants to know it. So we realized that there were so many of these 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 uh, very strange newfangled financial concepts. And they were relatively new, because they'd only been around for about 10 years. They were intricately bound into the financial system so tightly that whenever they started to fail, the whole system started to go down. So we realized, wow, we've got to do more than just explain the ins and outs of Wall Street. We've got to explain how these financial instruments work. So it was a really, it was a revelatory thing for us, and it was a revelatory thing for me, because then we started to tackle, and I'd encourage you to go and look at the whiteboards. You know, these are short videos, single take anything between three and eight minutes that break down all of these concepts. It's really really worth having a look at. And you comment on the bottom and tell me how bad they are, and I'll redo them. Um, but understanding that that need for explanatory journalism was really, really key for us. You know, we, as, as you are doing all the time, we, we, we did outreach with our, our listeners, outreach to the consumers. We identified a need. We saw there was a problem. And then we found a way to meet that need. And that's not something, frankly, that uh, public radio, in fact, radio and journalism in general does that, does that well. So it was good for us to be uh, at the front end of that kind of innovation. But as we were doing this, and I was going around and talking to people, and we were meeting people and, and talking about the product and how public radio was doing things, we realized that there was actually a de even, an even deeper need than wanting to know the basics of, or the, the, in, the ins and outs of these instruments. We realized that there's actually a really basic lack of understanding about even the most simple financial instruments. And it turned out that people would say to us, we'd say, we'd go to meetings and we'd expect people to say, can you, ex can you explain again how this credit default swap works or you know, how futures work, the really complicated stuff? People would say, you know, I really don't get how a bond works. Right? What's the difference between a bond and debt? And we'd be like, well, there is no difference. They're the same. People would say, what's the difference between stock and equity? Well, there is no difference. They're the same. And suddenly we realize that the whole lexicon of Wall Street has become so complicated, and it's treated like such a black art that it's become impenetrable. That even the most basic things that those, those of us who have been in financial journalism for a while who have worked on Wall Street, you know, we, we un understand instinctively. Regular people in the street who have checking accounts and go to the bank and use the financial system every day and are affected by it have really no concept of just the real, the real basic function of the financial system unless they really, really want to read in and work out how to do it. Suddenly, we started to see another need. It's just the, mo the need for the most basic explainers for the things that are going on on Wall Street, which is really what the, the, the book is about. So that gave rise to a whole new series of, um, of videos that we put out. And that really drove me to sort of put it down on paper as well, because we found that while many people love to watch videos, and they like to listen to the radio, people still love to have a paper product in their hand. I know that's really disturbing to many technologists, but it's, it's true. It's true. Um, so now that I've told you what we, we kind of both do, sort of, you know, drawn us together there, um, what can I tell you that, that you don't know? I don't think it's anything that you don't know. But you know, it's interesting to come here, you know, because you guys are you're the, you're the cream of Silicon Valley, really, the cream of the American workforce. And you do some really, really, really complicated things. I mean, you think the credit default swap is complicated? Wow. I can't, I can't imagine how difficult it is for some of you guys to explain exactly what it is that you do at dinner parties to people. You know, you're, maybe, you're, maybe you're an enterprise technical solutions engineer or a, a space planning analyst. You know, these are, this is what you are. This is what you do. And I, can, I imagine that it's actually quite difficult for you to explain these things to people who have no idea about anything about your world. So if you're you know, an engineer and you're hanging out with a bunch of liberal arts majors at the bar, you know, trying to get across what it is that you do can be extremely, really, extremely difficult. So uh, maybe, maybe I can help you with that. Um, but seriously, ex explaining is useful when you're trying to explain what you do at a, par at a party, but it's essential when you're trying to get your message across in whatever environment you're in. Okay? Whether you're you know, trying to get a message across to a client, you know, if you're trying to tell your supervisor about an idea that you have, or if you've got a room full of people that you're pitching your idea to, right, you need to be you need to have a number of, of basic elements to your presentation, right? You need to be succinct, you need to be speedy, but most of all, you need to find ways to connect, to use concepts in the explanation that you're, uh, you're providing uh, that your audience is familiar with and can relate to. So you really, what you really need is a story. And in radio, in public radio in particular, we're always really interested in the story. 
I mean, if you if you ever hear about ever hear of journalists talking, or if you're referring to many people refer to to uh, news items that they read in the newspaper, they talk about stories, right? And there's a reason that they talk about stories is because people can relate to stories. Many people relate very well to data. Many people relate very well to just the facts of the news, ma'am. But most people relate best to a story. So if one, our, our, the way that we look at our at news is, and the way that I look at delivering information, it's all about telling a story. Which if you read this book, you'll find that what I've done is I've taken a whole bunch of analogies and a whole bunch of stories, kind of strung them together, and I've used storytelling as the rubric to deliver information about some of the most complex parts of the financial markets. So if you are an enterprise technical solutions engineer or a space planning analyst, tell people a story about what you do rather than just you know, delivering the facts of what you do and relate it to what they do. So of course you have to find, first of all, you have to find, about, find out about your audience. So if you're an app developer, you might want to ask, you know, do you know what an app is? And I think you'd be surprised how many people don't know what an app is. If you're a space planner, maybe you want to ask if you've ever worked in a cubicle or what type of uh, office environment you have. A little empathetic interviewing is, is always a, a really, really good thing to do. You've got to know your audience. It was interesting. I, was at, uh, I did a fellowship uh, at Stanford a couple of years ago. And um, I went to work in the, the, the Hasso Plattner School of Design, the D School over there. And uh, it was very interesting having a bunch of journalists. There were about sort of seven or eight of us uh, journalists from the fellowship that had gone across to work in what's essentially part of the engineering department. I think it's part of the mechanical engineering department. And so we had a lot of interface with engineers. And for us, design and the whole idea of sort of you know, trying to put ideas together was really, really difficult. But engineers find it really, really simple. For engineers, going out and, and getting information out of people was really, really hard. But of course, it was second nature to us as journalists. And that's what one of the key parts of any conversation that you have, whenever you're trying to deliver information about anything, you need to find out about your audience. You've got to find out what your audience knows, what your audience doesn't know. So what I do is I, I, I make some assumption in this, in this book. I, I use analogies and characters that I assume that most people are going to know. I, I deal with things like turkeys and ice cream vans and the three little pigs and the godfather of the movie. So I use all of these things. And I'm assuming that most people who are reading the book will know these things. And hopefully they will. If not, they'll have to go out and read about them or rent the movie The Godfather, which is great, which is actually fine. That's a good, good bit of preparation. And that's another point is that you need to have some fun. All right? You don't have to be a comedian, but you don't want to take yourself too seriously either. So again, this book is about not taking the, the financial markets too seriously. We all know they take themselves way too seriously anyway, right? I mean, we have, if we haven't seen that over the last few years, what else do we know? So I'm trying not to take the financial markets too seriously, poking a little bit of fun maybe, and you know, it's, in, in a way, I'm poking a little bit of fun at myself. And that's, I think that's actually really key to explaining anything. If you show you have a sense of humor, then you're going to relate better to people. So back to empathetic interview. Um, who, who would like a, a quick, sort of smart, amusing way to understand the fiscal cliff? Any takers? Fiscal cliff, anyone? Good, yeah, good. OK, here's another one. Who's seen the movie Thelma and Louise? OK, who hasn't seen the movie Thelma and Louise? OK, spoiler alert. All right, there's a, there's a scene in this movie where Thelma and Louise are driving dangerously fast towards a cliff. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little drawing here. This is what I do with this, uh, this whiteboard product that I have. So I'm going to use the magic of Google technology here to do a little drawing. Um, so here we go. Can you see that? Yes, we can. All right, so here we are. Imagine uh, here's, our, here's our car. All right, and Thelma and Louise are in this car. And as I say, it is speeding along. It's like a Sunday afternoon. Here they are. Thelma, she is, and here's Louise. All right, speeding along in this car, and they're actually heading uphill towards a very, very sharp cliff. All right, very fast. Go down. All right, so they're motoring along here at high speeds, and so what, what, this is the the cliff. Essentially, is the economy. All right, so this is our economy. We do, right now, we're we're actually pulling up reasonably well. We're doing pretty well. Okay, well, not great. We're out of this slow and sluggish recovery that we have. So we're sort of driving uphill. But what we're worried about is that come you know, December the 31st, okay, we're going to go hurtling over a cliff. Everybody's worried about this. So that's the cliff. Let's talk about Thelma and Louise. Let me turn the page here if I can. All right, so here's, uh, here's Thelma. All right. And uh, Thelma is, a, here she is. Thelma is a, a woman of a certain age who happens to be uh, relatively wealthy. And she benefits hugely from the Bush tax cuts. Okay? She doesn't have to pay as much tax, which means she's got you know, much more money in her pocket than she had before. Here's Louise. All right. 
Louise is a, is a government servant. In fact, she works in the, uh, in the Defense Department. All right, so she's, she's a happy woman because we know defense um, pays very well. This is Louise here. Now, the problem is that come the, uh, come the end of the year, a couple of things are going to happen if Congress doesn't act. Right, the first thing that's going to happen is the Bush tax, Bush tax cuts are going to expire. All right, so if the Bush tax cuts expire, all right, this is going to make Thelma very unhappy. All right, because she's going to get taxed more. Okay, so she is suddenly going to run. She's going to have a lot less money to spend. Okay, Louise, come the end of the year, the other thing that's going to happen because of the the, the finagling that we had a couple of uh, about a year ago over the uh, raising the debt ceiling. Remember, they said, oh, we'll let it go, but you know, come the end of this year, what's going to happen is we're going to make a bunch of cuts across the board, and particularly in the Defense Department. So come the end of the year, Louise is going to be at, Louise is here is going to be out of a job. All right, so she's going to be pretty unhappy as well. All right, so I've got to, so she's going to be unhappy too. And what we have is the money that people were able to, had saved because of the Bush tax cut will dry up. So there'll be less money in people's pockets as a result of that Bush, of the, uh, the lack of extension of the Bush tax cuts. And because you've got a bunch of people laid off in the Defense Department, you're going to have less money here as well. Now, we all know that our economy pretty much thrives on spending. All right? We hear this all the time. And some people talk about you know, the 70% uh, the of, of economic output in the US is because of spending, uh, consumer spending. That's actually a fairly inaccurate number, but it's still extremely high. The, the economy is really, really dependent on, on consumer spending. And if you've got consumers like Thelma and Louise, who've got a lot less money coming into their pockets, okay, it means that, well, essentially, if you think of the car as the economy, all right, it means that they're not going to be able to pay to fix the brakes or get the oil changed. So when you're heading towards a cliff, suddenly there's, there's nothing stopping you going over the edge. All right? And these were, it means that we're going to plunge over the edge. This lack of spending is going to really put us straight back into, a, into, into the hole that we've been in the past. So that's how, that's how the fiscal cliff is going to work, and uh, that is if it's, allowed to, if it's allowed to occur. All right? So what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to use stories and analogy okay, to explain a financial concept. Were there any holes in that for you guys? Did anybody see any holes in there, some, some areas that I, that I didn't cover? Or have I explained the fiscal cliff to you? Well, the government will hold it because it wants to pay off its deficits. So the reason is, the, the, remember we had the debt ceiling conversation. It's like we don't, want to raise, we don't want to increase our deficit. So the whole idea of having these spending cuts and these, uh, having more tax going into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the federal government means that they can then use that money to pay off the debt as opposed to injecting it back into the economy in some way and helping the economy grow again. I mean, remember, the way that um, spending works in the economy is that you know, people like you and I go out and we buy a home, for example. I mean, they, there's a reason that uh, houses are regarded as the biggest, housing is regarded as one of the biggest engines of the economic recovery is because people buy a house, but they don't just buy a house. They buy carpets, they buy curtains, they buy you know, fridge freezers, they buy a car to put in the garage, all this stuff. So all the spending that they do drives demand, and that means that manufacturers then have to create more. And the reason, the way that they do that is by hiring more people and buying more property and you know, cranking out more stuff. And then you have this, this very positive cycle because as more people are employed, then they're going to spend more. They're going to go out and buy houses, and suddenly you have this very beneficial effect cycling through the economy. At least that's the theory. Of course, there are a lot of people that don't like the fact that we have a mainly a consumer economy and are very upset about that. But right now, that's the way we're configured. So that's the way we're, that's the way we're set up. So the whole point of um, a book like this is to take, as I say, the, these potentially extremely complicated terms and turn them into really stories that everybody can relate to. So what I'd like to ask, are there any, other, are there any terms out there that people have difficulty with when they hear about them, um, you know, when they're listening to the news or reading the news. Like, I, I don't understand what this is. Are, is. are there any sort of hot points for people? Any words that we don't understand? Yes. Well, again, quantitative easing is all about, okay, well, let, let me, let me uh, use an analogy that I actually use in the book. Okay, so I want you to imagine, I'm not going to drill this, it's really hard to drill, all right, but I want you to imagine a swimming pool, okay, that's got kind of a dam at one end of it, all right? And the swimming pool is, Behind the dam, which is like, say, you know, three quarters of the way up, behind the dam is like, full of water. And then the rest of the swimming pool is like sort of a little bit, so you have to swim in that one end of the, of the, of the, of the pool, the damned end. And the other end, you sort of paddle around. It's a little bit of water, ankle deep water right there. Okay. The stuff that's behind the dam is where the banks are. Okay. That's where the banks, that's where all the money is. It's all in the banks. Okay. And the, the, what happens is money kind of sloshes in and sloshes out of the paddling part of the pool. 
you don't want too, money, too much money in that end of the pool because not everybody can swim that well, right? You want people to sort of paddle around and that helps things grow in there because this is a pool that's got stuff growing in there. So that helps, that helps stuff grow and people are quite happy paddling around. The problem is, is that what we've got, the situation that we have now is that there's not enough water in that end of the pool, all right? The banks aren't sloshing enough water in there, okay? And what's happened is that we've got this kind of dry situation and that, 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 that water is really money. That's the money that we use to, to go out and, and borrow to buy stuff, to buy those houses, to buy those cars, to buy those fridge freezers and all the rest of it. Right now, we're not able to borrow. It's really, really difficult for us to borrow. So quantitative, usually what happens in the financial system is we have a set amount of money, okay, in the system. And the money sloshes in and sloshes out. So the bankers will chuck a bucket over and then when we're saving, we'll chuck a bucket back and all the rest. It's usually the same amount of, of water. Quantitative easing is like the janitor coming along with a hose pipe and turning, turning it on and pumping a whole lot of extra water in there. And the idea is that he's flooding that end. And when, it, when I say in there, I mean the banking end, not in the, account, not, not in the shallow end, in the deep end. They're pumping extra water into the deep end. The idea is to make the banker so uncomfortable, all right, that they want to just start bailing water out much, much more quickly. Because here's the thing, bankers, this is, this is going to sound really weird, bankers hate money, okay? They hate it. Okay, they don't hate it. But they hate having just, they hate only, they hate cash. They hate having to sit on cash. Because cash doesn't make any money. Cash just sits there. In fact, cash is a depreciating asset because of inflation. It's worth less every day. I mean, only fractionally in our economy. But it's worth less as time goes on. Bankers want to invest money. But right now, they're really nervous about investing. They're like, oh no, we're quite happy to just sort of swim around because, you know, we want to have lots of cash around just in case, there's, just in case something happens. So they're sitting on all sorts of cash. Also, to be fair to the banks, because the government's asking them to keep more cash around. So by pumping, more, by pumping more money into the banking end of the system, they're hoping that the bankers will say, God, we've got so much of this cash. It's not making us any money. Let's find ways to make it money. Let's toss it into the other end of the pool. So they're, throwing, they're hoping that the banks will throw buckets of water into the shallow end of the pool to people like us. And we'll be like, oh, yes, please, please, feed, help us drink. And we'll be able to take this money and run around and spend it on all sorts of things and then for have this cycle, this positive cycle throughout the economy where people start buying stuff, employers start hiring again, and then the economy starts to grow. So that's, that, that's my swimming pool analogy of how quantitative easing works. Of course, a lot of people say, what are the problems is now we've got all of this money that's sloshing this extra money. Well, what happens? One of the dangers is that if too much money goes into the wider economy, we have inflation, where you've got much more money chasing a relatively small amount of goods. And what does that do? It drives the costs of everything really, really high. Now, we've had two, we're obviously in the third round of quantitative easing now, but the previous two rounds actually didn't do much in terms of inflation, barely moved the needle. It wasn't really a problem. People are still worried about going forward. So what happens, you ask, to that money? Does it just sit around? No, in actual fact, the janitor can then get a bucket and start dipping a bucket into the banker's end and taking money back out of there. Okay, he can actually, that's what Ben Bernanke will in fact do. This is called the destruction of money. This is done through something called the repo system, which I can talk about in a little bit if you want. But essentially it is effectively that janitor, Ben, ben the janitor, coming along, dipping a, a, a bunch of buckets in to take the money back out of the system. So once again, we have the same amount of money in the monetary system that we had before. How's that? Great, thank you. Right, any other any other terms that people are, are nervous about or confused about? Unsure about? Yes. Well, yes, they do that just through lending. So if you want to think of, I mean, maybe there's sort of two little pipes at the bottom of the system, at the bottom of the uh, the wall there, and one pipe pumps money out, and that's done through mortgage lending, through car lending, student loans, all the rest of it. Any any kind of lending activity that sends money out into the wider economy. And of course, the other tube is where we pump it back in, which of course we do through savings. And right now, the savings rate is going up in the US. People are socking away money. So you've got, you've got sort of cash flowing in and out of the banking system. And it's not the entirely, I mean, let's, let's, I don't want to vilify the banks too much. It's not entirely the bank's fault that we're socking away money like this and actually not spending it because we're being as every bit as cautious as they are. That's a great question. Thank you. But well, the gold standard, um, does everybody know, does anybody, okay, let me explain what the gold standard is. The gold standard was back in the day, back before the Nixon administration, whenever they, they removed the gold standard, it used to be that every dollar was worth a certain amount of gold. And in theory, you could take your, you could take your dollar and walk in and say, give me a dollar's worth of gold. And they would give you like a tiny little grain. No, they wouldn't. I mean, they, but essentially that was what it was worth. So every dollar was backed by gold, which was in Fort Knox or wherever they, wherever they kept the gold. So of course, 
you now know that your dollar is actually worth something real, right? It's actually worth something. So if you have enough of those dollars, you can walk out with a nugget or an ink or whatever it is. So there's, there's, a, there's a mental appeal to that of knowing what your dollar is actually worth. But of course, it gets complicated if you want to do things like spend vast amounts of money on defense spending or build a whole load of bridges and freeways around the country because maybe you don't have that much gold. It's really Suddenly, if you want to go out and get extra gold in order to, to print more money, you've got to go to South Africa or wherever it is and do a bunch more mining or go to China and beg them to sell you your gold or whatever it is. And that can get extremely expensive because what happens? As soon as you have a large economy that needs more money, the price of gold is going to go through the roof because demand has risen so much, right? It's a classic supply and demand issue. And what does that do? That increases the value of the dollar, okay? And then you have this, um, this, this terrible deflation system where you've got the dollar has become so expensive and goods, you know, have, have become devalued in comparison. So people were really wor very nervous about this. So they said, well, let's get, let's get rid of this thing because it doesn't give us any freedom as an economy. If we want to expand, that really restricts our freedom. So they created what's called fiat currency. And fiat currency basically means it is what the government says it is. Okay, this, this is worth a dollar because the government says it's worth a dollar, which is a really kind of weird system, right? It means that really the dollar is worth only the paper that it's written on. And it's only the government's word that actually makes it worth any money. So it can be a very difficult system, very, very difficult thing to, for people to grasp. And what it really comes down to is trust. You've got to trust your government. You've got to trust that your dollar is going to be worth the same today or sorry, the same tomorrow as it is today, or the same in two years as it is today. And of course, that doesn't happen because we have inflation. So what we do is we trust the government to make sure that inflation is low and that our dollars are not devalued. So it's not surprising, especially in an era where we have all sorts of quantitative easing, where we have all of this money that's sloshing around the system and people are really worried about inflation. They say, maybe we should go back to the gold standard where everything is worth something real. So it's totally understandable why people say that. But I have to tell you that going to a system now, going back to a system where every dollar was backed with a certain amount of gold would be incredibly difficult to do. Firstly, there's not that much gold in, in the world right now. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, look at the size of the economies that we have now. Imagine if China decided to do the same thing at the same time that we did it, and Europe as well. I mean, how much gold would you be getting for your euro? It would be like, I mean, infinitesimal. So it's, it's understandable that people are interested in the, in, the, in the gold standard, but it's a very, very difficult system to go back to. That's a great question. Thank you. Well, you have to spend less. I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the similarity between a, a government and like a house, you know, somebody's, indivi somebody's individual bank account, you know, their own personal economies. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, the, the, the analogy doesn't extend much further, but essentially you've got money coming in the door and money going out the door. And that money coming in the door comes from, you know, the, the amount, whatever you've sold your, 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 uh, your, your ability to work for, plus debt that comes in the door. And money that goes out the door is all the stuff that you spend on, all the services that you have around the home, electricity, heating, whatever, plus the, you know, your car, plus the interest that you're paying on that debt that's coming in the door. So, you know, when you look at it like that, that looks a lot like the economy. So really, the only way you can reduce those costs, those expenditure costs, is by cutting back. It's by heating your house less. Maybe it's like wearing a sweater for longer. You know, maybe it's like you know, getting a, selling one car and getting a cheaper car, but you have to cut your costs, which is what all of the, all of the shenanigans going on in the government is all about right now. It's like ha to, ha trying to decide what it is that you cut. Yes, of course, you could remove all social programs, crank the tax rate up. Suddenly, you've got much more money coming in the door. If, you're, if your tax rate is at 40%, Suddenly, you've got way more money coming in the door. If you remove all of those entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the rest of it, suddenly, you've got much less money going out the door. And yeah, it's going to be easy to pay your debt off then. Absolutely. I mean, this, the logic is impeccable. But the practicality of that is extremely difficult. I mean, you think about what we spend as a nation every year. More than 50% of the money that we spend is spent on mandatory spending programs, like Social Security, like Medicare. These are programs that cannot, it's not like a business, where a business owner can turn around and go, you know what? We're going to get rid of the. We're going to get rid of the Android division. It's gone. All right. A company can do that. A company can say, you know what? We're going to get out of the software business. Let's get into the healthcare business. And a company can do that. It can make those changes. An, an economy cannot. We are required to provide those services by law. Sure, you can trim them down, and that's a lot of what the back and forth is about in Congress. You can you can shrink them and make them smaller, but getting rid of them altogether is extremely difficult. So what's 
what's not mandatory, the, what's what they call the discretionary spending. But it's all these really unimportant things like education, roads, the Coast Guard, defense, right? These are, this is the, this is the non, this is the discretionary spending. This is the stuff that the government is not required, mandated to spend on. But again, you try and cut that stuff and boy, people are going to start to howl. So yes, in principle, absolutely right. You could cut those, you, you could reduce those programs and reduce your spending, but actually making the decision, have the, the, the way to go about making the decisions, what to cut and what not to cut, are extremely difficult and fraught with politics. I mean, a lot, one of the things about what's interesting about the presidential election is that you have Mitt Romney walking around and saying, look, I'm a businessman. You know, I, I've had so much experience in business. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know how to be able to handle you know, our economy better. And of course, in many ways, that's true. It's, it would be great to have someone who understands how business works to, uh, to run the economy, especially when it's got sort of business functions. But Mitt Romney is the head of the CEO of a company or a CEO of a company when he wants to make a decision or a CEO of a company. What he says or what she says goes, right? You know, they're at the top of a pyramid and everybody reports up the pyramid. So essentially, everybody reports to the CEO. In, a pres in, a, in an economy, that's not the case. In a government, you, he's got whatever, you know, 600 odd people in the, in the Congress up on Capitol Hill and the Senate and the House of Republicans and the, the House of Representatives, sorry, reporting not to him, but reporting to us. So if the president goes down and says, I want you to vote my way on this bill, they're like, uh, no, I report to, you know, Jill and Ben over here. I don't report to you. You can't tell me what to do. So a very, not, not really a parallel structure. So the same rules in, at, at that point do not apply. Yes, um, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, I think that I like to, to liken our regulatory system to, um, and, and the, the financial services system within it to, it's kind of like a, um, a, a teenager who's growing up and has been wearing the same clothes since he was nine years old. All right, he's now 15. He's starting to play football and he's busting out of these clothes, right? Everything is completely threadbare. This is what our financial system is like. Over the last 20 to 30 years, our financial system has gone off on steroids. Okay, it's gone crazy. All of this financial innovation that you've heard about, you know, these credit default swaps, these CDOs, these are relatively recent uh, arrivals in the market. And what has happened is that the regulatory system has not kept up. Now, the regula regulatory system in its current form was really created in the 1930s after the Great Depression. And you know what? It was a great system for its time. It really, really worked well. And what we've done since then, we just sort of we've patched it here and there, and we've cut holes in it here and there. It's a bit like a, a sort of a leaky bucket, all right, that's been sort of taped up, and then it's leaked again, it's taped up again, and it leaks again, you tape it up again. You know what I'm talking about. So it's, it's now turned into this sort of monster of tape and metal and sort of leaking water everywhere. That's what our regulatory system looks like now with regard to the financial system. So you've got these incredibly smart people who are working in finance, who are coming up with all these amazing ideas about how to make money, but really the regulators are you know, two decades behind. They don't really understand. I mean, if you, if you ever listened to any of the, um, uh, the congressional um, statements on, that, that came out after the financial crisis, it was very, very clear that people on Capitol Hill had no idea what they were dealing with. And they were still thinking stocks and bonds, whereas Wall Street was thinking, you know, you know Martian credit default swaps. I mean, it was just ridiculous. There was no, no correlation in, in knowledge. So. What, what, is, what we really need is a financial system that is, I, I believe, and this is just a very personal opinion, but I believe we need a financial system that is simpler and a lot more robust and much, much better policed. Because what's happened over the last, you know, well, 50 years really, is that the rise of the bank lobby has empowered politicians, or has really forced politicians to, to sort of pick the bones of the, uh, the policing of the regulatory system clean. The SEC has been underfunded, has been undermanned, and really just can't compete with Wall Street. And also, it's punched holes in the system that allow banks ways to, to, to look, for, you know, look for ways around the system in order to make money. And nobody's kind of sort of stitched those loopholes closed. And in fact, many people have tried to, to tear them and make them, make them bigger. So that's really what the problem is. But, but, but you know, don't blame the banks for this, because the banks are glands, OK? They don't, they don't, there's no sensibility there. There's no moral morality there. Their job is to make money for their shareholders, plain and simple. That's what their job is. They are there to crank out as much money for their shareholders, which obviously includes the board and all the rest of it. And by the way, you and I, because our 401ks and 403bs are invested in large part with the banks, their job is to make money for us. And they'll do whatever it takes to make as much money as possible. So what stands in the way of them and hell? 
Well, the regulatory system, which is why the regulatory system has to be a lot simpler so everybody can understand it. Even we can understand it, and the most importantly, perhaps the politicians can understand it, and much tighter in terms of its, its police, the way that it's policed. The question of the de that's the question of the decade. That's a, that's a good question. I mean, the, you know, that was the fear, right? Is that uh, that's why Hank Paulson did what he did. I mean, Hank Paulson, I mean, you think about this. This was a, a guy who came from, from Goldman Sachs. He was the kind of person who would never want to, to, to regulate the banks, who would want to get out of the way of the banks at, at all costs and, you know, let them do what they do and, you know, for the good of the economy. And there he is basically standing in, in the way and saying, forget the free market. Forget that. Forget you know all the uh, the principles of Ayn Rand and all the rest of it. I'm going to stand there. I'm going to catch these guys and cosset them like a real Democrat. You know, I mean, this was very very unusual for someone like that to, to be doing what he did. And the reason was because he was afraid that the whole system would just come crashing down. I mean, the way the way I, I describe it in, in the book is, I, I, I the, the analogy I use is like it's a string of mountain climbers. All right, you know, they're all climbing up a mountain together. And, that, and anyone who's done any mountaineering knows that you rope yourselves together, right? You're all roped up. And the, the reason you do that is because if one person falls, then you hope, all right, that the combined weight of everybody else will actually stop that guy or that woman from going over the edge, and they'll be able to sort of claw themselves back up. Right, but what happened is, imagine now that one of these banks is so enormous, okay, or the, the precipice is so steep and the ground is so treacherous, that when that person goes over the edge, suddenly everybody's being pulled with them. And there's a real danger that everybody's going to go over the edge. That's what Hank Paulson was worried about. He was worried that Lehman Brothers, because of the system of credit default swaps that tied everybody together, and not just that, but also the way that the overnight banking system worked, and not just that, but the fact that if one bank goes, then no bank will ever trust any other bank again, and suddenly the system will freeze. He worried that it was just going to drag the entire system over the cliff, and it was going to destroy the, not just the American financial system, but the global financial system. And he said the risks were just too great. Now, if you speak to my father, he'll say, yes, we should have just let them go. And, you know, let the, let the chips fall where they may. But, you know, my dad lives in a little cottage in Northern Ireland in the middle of nowhere and doesn't depend on any of that stuff. He's retired. You know, so it's all very well for him to say that. But for those of us who are still invested, and we all are, if we have a retirement account, if nothing else, you know, that's a really, really dangerous thing for us. And, you know, if we, if we work for a company that, that needs the financial system in order to get business done, whether it be to borrow money in order to, to, buy, uh, to, to, to buy property around the world or to hire more people, or whether it be because we have a company that invests in securities, our, our lives are intricately tied, intricately tied in, intricately tied in sorry, with, with the financial system. So there was real fear there. Now, 2020 hindsight. If we let the banks go, where would we be today? You know, maybe if Goldman Sachs is to be believed, they, rec they said that they had enough money that they would be able to withstand that. So, you know, they would actually have, have a good enough ice axe that they'd be able to sort of hang on there and they would have been okay. And eventually, after a little bit of freezing up, they would be able to claw themselves back up again. JP Morgan said the same thing. Wells Fargo said the same thing. So maybe what would have happened is Lehman Brothers would have disappeared. Everything would have frozen solid for a couple of months. But then people would have sort of gradually sort of warmed up and started getting to each other again and, and things would have improved. And it's a possibility. But making that call, I would not like to have been in that room at the time. But the question, so the, the point was that the financial system is, is inherently unstable. And perhaps what we need is a, a new foundation, maybe to, re, so to, if I understand you correctly, to recreate the, the, the fundamentals of the financial services system. You know, maybe, I mean, I, that's certainly a, an argument that I've heard made a number of times. The, I think that the, the reality is that, you know, we're dealing with, um, you know, the, the trading of securities and the dealing, the, the, the way that you deal with money is inherently risky. Okay, people are always taking risk in order to get a reward. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're part of the problem, okay? The shareholder economy is part of the problem. Because people like us put our money into investment, and put our money into investment funds, which then go to banks and say, you better make money. Go to companies and say, you better make money. It pushes those companies and those banks to take risks, okay? And unless you have like a really good foundation in which they can take risks, you're, you're in trouble, right? Because they're going to they're fall through the floor. So I think, that, I think that, yes, the system is not robust enough. Do we need a new system? I don't know. I think that the, the original system that we had was, was pretty good. I mean, I think that the, the system they designed after the, uh, the Great Depression was pretty solid. 
we've kind of, we haven't maintained it properly. Like I say, we punched a few holes in it here and there, and that's a problem. So I think it needs to be, it needs to be overhauled, but I don't think it needs to be replaced. But what I do think is that we need to give mind to something that the Europeans are doing much more of. And I, you're, you sound like you're from Europe, okay? So what the Europeans are doing is they're saying that there should be a, almost, a, this is not specifically what they're saying, but they're implying that there should be a morality clause built into to bank business. The banks should be required almost to sign up to a, a sort of a morality charter that says, you know what, we are required to, we're part of society, therefore we should behave as though we're part of society. Now banks will tell you here that that's what they already do. You know, we're, we're part of society and we give money to charity and this and that. But I think that, and that's one thing, they'll say one thing, but I think what they actually do, when you actually see what they do, yes, of course they are, they're one of the mainstays of society. But when it comes to actually making money, that, that part of thinking about the rest of us is, is, is not really part and parcel of that. They think, they think about the rest of us in the way that you know, Adam Smith thinks about the rest of us, right? It's like enlightened self-interest. You drive, drive, drive to make money, and then and that, that will therefore blossom into, into good things down the line. Now, I think that, that that logic only goes so far. Blocking out all morality is a, is a real problem. And I think that what we do need, I think, is some kind of required structure for banks to, to invest in on, a, on moral terms so that they understand that they're part of society and they shouldn't be risking all. Because if they do, they will indeed risk all when it comes to society too. Ah, this includes punishment. Yes, punishment. Yeah, so we haven't seen much punishment, have we, for the banks? Yeah, and I think, and I know that's one of the things that people get really, really upset about. It's, uh, and, and part of the reason for this is because we have this poorly understood system that's very poorly regulated or is not poorly policed. So if you don't have a, a strong system of rules that address themselves to every part of the system and comprehend the system completely, how can you have a punishment? Because, you know, we'll wriggle out of it and someone says, oh, well, we meant to do this and it looks like this. And then, you know, the regulators are completely bamboozled because they don't get it and haven't been following it and haven't been paid to follow it for long enough. And these people skate free. So, yes, I think you're absolutely right. We do need to have sanctions. But it's very, very difficult to have sanctions in a system where even the police don't really understand what the heck is going on. Well, I think that um, we do have racketeering laws, of course, but then the racketeering laws are probably put together in you know, the 1940s to deal with the mafia, as opposed to having to deal with you know, you know, people at, at an investment bank. And the other thing is, those racketeering laws usually require, um, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but they usually require knowledge of sort of a, a chain of command that sort of actually, actually wants you to do something very, very specific, and then it happens, and then you, know, you can bring a case. In the case of the banks, it's like, these people are empowered to just make money. It's like, guys, go and make money the best way you can. You're smart guys, you figure it out, get it done. And make sure it remains within the law. And as far as the law is concerned, it does remain in the, within the law. So it's all about, it's all about your ability to inter interpret whether or not the, the lines have been overstepped in these cases. But you were going to follow up. Well, here's the thing. So if they were selling something to you and me, then we could get, we, that, that's illegal. They can't do that, all right? So if they're, if they're coming to us and they're saying, you should buy this investment, this is great, and, and, and people do go to jail for this. They go to old ladies and you, know, you, you have these unscrupulous lender, with, unscrupulous investment companies that will go to, to old ladies and retired people and they'll say, oh, you should really buy this. It's gonna return you 9% a year. Everything's gonna be fine. And the next thing, it disappears in the twinkle of an eye, right? That's illegal and people go to jail for that. What we have in the investment banking system is that you have people you have, say, a comp uh, uh, one investment bank will go to another investment bank and say, you should buy this product. <laughs> this product is complete rubbish. Put lipstick on that pig, all right? They know that it's a bad product. And what are they doing? Not only are they selling it to that, or they believe it's a bad product, they're not only selling it to that person, to that other investment bank, but they're also betting against it. They're saying, we think it's so bad, we're actually going to bet against this thing. There's a concept in investment banking called big boy language. Okay? It goes into all of these, um, it, all of these investing documents. So you, go, you get a bank loan. If you buy a piece of a, a bank loan, they put this thing in called big boy language. And basically it's saying, you and I are big boys. We know what's going on here. This thing could be complete rubbish, but you're buying it on site and you know it could be complete rubbish, but you're going to buy it anyway. And once you've signed the big boy language, there's nothing you can do. The investment bank who bought it and it went you know, right into the toilet 10 seconds later can scream and howl as much as it wants. The other bank will just flick this big boy language and say, look, here it is, you signed the paper. So the other point is that 
when you have, when, when somebody, it's, it's kind of like gambling. You know, you go, if, you, if you make a bet on something, somebody's got, to, somebody's got to take the other side of the action, right? You go to a bookie and you make a bet on a horse, the, the, the bookie is taking the other side of that action. The same goes with, the, uh, with, 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 investment, with investment banks. They're making bets on things and somebody else has to take the other side. Somebody's got to sell them something. Somebody's got to sell you something in order for you to buy it. So all they're saying is, listen, we're selling you this thing. We may bet against it. Here's the big boy language, but they're like, okay, we'll take it. We think it's, got, we think it's gonna do better than you do. And uh, we'll, we'll take our chances. So yes, it, it sounds on the face of it to us, it sounds incredible. It sounds illegal. But in fact, it's absolutely legal and it's been happening for decades. Well, I think a lot of people call um, taxing consumption, it's like a regressive tax, right? Because, you know, poor people, they've got to, you've got to eat, right? So if you start charging, if you start taxing them for pretty much everything that they consume, then it, it really affects poor people more. I mean, it, it, this, is a, this is a policy discussion that, you know, I think happens ad infinitum and, and has been happening for a very long time. I mean, there are, there are many societies that put a, I think Singapore, for example, has very high consumption tax. You know, here we have relatively low consumption tax. Um, and I think the UK now has a consumption tax. So a lot, I think most societies are now doing something in between, right? But um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's one of these open questions. I mean, I could, I could, I could, we can sit down and debate it afterwards, but it would be a debate rather than anything else. Yes. Oh no, it wasn't empty. It wasn't really. Em it wasn't really empty. Well, what what happened? Okay, so yes, yeah, so this is a very good question. Okay, so what we had is virtual water. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. If you, whenever the way the banking system works is is I if I go to a bank and I, I put a hundred dollars into the bank, okay, the bank then has to the bank has there's a credit for me for a hundred dollars. So so say say you give me say I'm a bank and you give me a hundred dollars. All right, you've now got a hundred dollars, but it happens to be in the bank. I then have to keep, say, 5% of that. So I keep $5 in the bank, and I can turn around, and I can lend you $95, all right? So now, there's, a hundred, there's now $200 in the system, all right? And then you can go and give it to another bank, and suddenly you start to see exponentially the amount of money that there is in the system. Now, a lot of this is just notional money, because, you know, there's only, oh, if you came to me today and said, I want my $100 back, I'd be like, okay. And I'd have to turn around and borrow it from somebody else. And that's, this is slightly off your, off, away from your question, but what happens, what's happened, what happens in the banking system is that this happens all the time. Banks run out of money, okay? This is, it sounds absurd, right? But they actually run out of money, so they have to go to other banks to borrow money. So, like, so say, for example, this is what happened in Lehman Brothers. Well, no, that's not a good example because Lehman Brothers was not a commercial bank. But say, for example, I'm the bank, you want your money from me, I have to go to another bank, and that bank says to me, no. I'm not going to lend you. I'm not going to lend you that money overnight because what they usually do it in what's called the overnight market. The bank says to me, you know, J.P. Morgan says to me, I'm not. I'm not lending the bank of Paddy Hirsch money overnight because I don't. I, don't tr I think you're invested in really dodgy securities. What do you mean? So, well, you, if you're invested in bad securities, it means that you're not going to be able to redeem those securities for any money, which means you're not going to be able to pay, pay me back, let alone you. So suddenly. I'm, I'm, I'm bust. Nobody's lending me any money. I owe you $95. I can give you five. Sorry. But then, but I'm, I'm, I'm bust. And that's really the root cause of what happened in the, when, the, when we were worried about the financial system collapsing. It was the fact that these banks would not lend to each other. And if banks stop lending to each other, it's like you stop the flow of blood around the body. And suddenly you have, you know what it's like when you stop blood, blood flowing around the body is bits of the body start to drop off, right? You know, they get gangrenous and horrible. And, you know, they fall off. So that's really what happened is that the, the, the lifeblood started to, to slow down and maybe even stop. And the, the urgency was keeping that lifeblood going. But you had another question, which was, where did that money go? Oh, yes, so in the, financial, in the financial system. So in the financial crisis. So what had happened is, as people get these credits in their account, they start, they start behaving as though that's real money. So suddenly you have all this money stacking up. And if you've taken all sorts of, um, if you've made bets with people and you've say, this is what happened with these credit default swaps, where they sort of made bets on, uh, on people's ability to, to pay a, a loan down the road. So say, for example, you know, John, has a, uh, John has bought a car, for example, and, it's, um, and I, and I, I want to bet that John's, car, John's going to crash his car within the next five years. I can take a bet with you, and I can pay you five bucks a month to take, or five bucks a week to take that action. So every, every, every week I'll pay you five dollars, and if John does crash his car, that indeed, you pay me the entire worth of John's car, 
All right, so this is great. But what I can do is I can, re I can register that as an asset. I can say I essentially own the money, that, that, oh, but only if it, so you can register this as an asset. So what you had is all of this financial shenanigans that allowed people to, to, to show all of this income in their, and this, this huge bottom line in their bank accounts, and a, much of it was notional. It's kind of like when you own a house, and you, you, know, you, you value your house, and you say, you, know, you bought the house for $300,000. Okay, then the market jacks up, and now the house is worth $600,000. So you take the equity out, okay, and then the house drops back down again. Well, the, you know, that, that house was never really worth $600,000, but yet you've taken the money out of it. Now your house is underwater, and you owe that money back in again. That's the kind of place where all the money disappeared. It was this notional concept of, what, of the value of certain assets that just disappeared whenever the market dropped away. And that didn't just happen in housing. That happened in, in, for, for, in, for cars in many cases. It certainly happened for credit default swaps. It happened for stocks and shares and bonds, all sorts of assets. So this kind of, this is why they call, this is why you hear the term frothy in the market. It was just like froth on the, on the, on the top of a beer. You know, that froth, this, it looks great. The beer's this big. The froth just, just sort of slowly goes down and, you know, that's, that's it. That's, that's what happened. So it's, it, it's all that froth that we're talking about. So really when people say, where did all the money go? Well, the money didn't really exist in the first place. It just looked like it did. Wow. Thanks for that. Um, yes, it is. Yes, it is possible because we can't use the gold standard. Yes. That is, it's one of the, it's one of the downsides. Definitely. We're looking for a happy medium, yes. I think everybody's looking for a happy medium. But I think that, you know, there's, there's really, with the way the bubbles were, and that's one of the things about gold standard, they said, well, there, was, there were never any bubbles when we had a gold standard. But that's not entirely true, because if you think of the, you, you may have heard of the, the tulip bubble in, in the 1500s, and they had the gold standard then, they had a bubble then, but it was a, an, an asset, it was a, that was a particular asset, the, the, the value of, um, of these tulip bulbs. So it's not entirely true that you don't have bubbles, but they're, they're, you probably get less of them with the gold standard because you don't have the ability to print money. Yeah, the, well, let's deal with 47% first. So yes, what's really interesting about that um, statement is that a significant proportion of the 47% are probably Republican voters. It just drives me, it amazes me. You know, it's the, it's the same, it, it's, this falls into the same rubric as the, as the get your government hands off my Medicare comment. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's really interesting to hear him say that because, you know, a lot of those people are a lot of those people are retired. They're not paying any income tax, and a lot of retired voters vote Republican. You know, so that's it's crazy that 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 he would make that statement. And I'm, you know, I, I watched the entire video, so or certainly right up to that point. So I know that he wasn't quoted out of context there. Um, that said, you know, th there is th it's true we have a system that is open to abuse, and some people do abuse it. But I don't think 47% of the population abuses it. Now, the, the question about the amount of tax that, uh, or how you can avoid the AMT. I mean, you have to speak to a tax advisor about avoiding the AMT, which I, I'm sure you could do if you were. Well, well, he's done it. He's done it because he doesn't pay. He doesn't. He doesn't get income. You see, not in the way that we understand it. He has this thing called. He has this thing called carried interest. Okay, and what this is is if you are a, a private equity fund. Okay, usually, you know, we we get we get paid a paycheck every month, right? That's that's how it works for us. When you're, a, when you're in charge of a hedge fund, what, what happens is you're making investments. So as the partner in a hedge fund, it's almost as though you're, you're just buying stocks and shares. I mean, you're obviously buying more than that, but it's like you're buying stocks and shares, and then every month you get paid interest. So you're get, you get paid through interest, and, but interest only gets taxed at a very low percent, at 15%. Okay, so, and carried interest only occurs once every couple of years because the way that, as, I mean, I'm sure, most people know about the venture capital market more than I do now, but the way venture capital works is that you only get paid out as an investor whenever the, um, whenever the exit uh, from, from, the, from the investment occurs. So that could be like two, three, five, seven years down the line. So a lot of the time this money is coming in a lump sum, but it's still only investment income. He's not being paid a check monthly by his, by his employer, by Bain Capital. So everything for him, all of his money comes in through investments. And the, the, the reason I think that um, this is entirely subjective on my part, but one of the reasons I think that the Romney campaign was so reluctant to release this information is because, not because there's anything illegal in it, I think it was completely legal. I think it's, the scary thing is what you can get away with that's legal. I mean, it's really, it's like, this is, this is legal? It's totally legal. So he didn't do anything illegal, but I think it's, it, it really kind of, um, it's kind of a 
poke in the in, in the eye for uh, for the tax regime that you can get away with this kind of thing. And I think and I think a lot of people think that it's extremely unfair. But that's really where it comes into it is investment income and not income as as, as uh, not earned income as you as you and I have. Can we afford Obamacare? Well, we're paying for it right now. So we, we've got it right now. It seems actually I think that what's really interesting about the um, the, the Romney plan and the and Obamacare as exists today, there's very little to choose between them, frankly. I mean, everybody talks about this, uh, the great saving that, um, that, uh, that, that the, the, the Ryan plan is going to make five years down the road. This is exactly the great saving that Obamacare is already making right now. So I think that, you know, that there's not much to choose between the two plans. Whether or not we can afford Obamacare, I, I, don't, I actually don't think so. I think cuts are going to have to be a lot deeper than they are right now. I mean, to, just to, to keep... Um, to keep the system funded okay, is going to be a problem, but to keep the system funded and to pay down the deficit to some extent is going to be really, really hard to do. And it's clear that they're going to have to make deeper cuts than they've made right now. They're going to be extremely difficult to do politically. They've got to be done, otherwise the system, I think, is going to bust itself. So I think as it stands right now in the situation that we're in right now, probably not. No, I don't think we could. So we're going to have to make some cuts elsewhere. All right. Thank you all very much indeed. I really appreciate it. Thank you.